So uh, we invited um, Professor Rob Norris uh, to basically share with us some of his research and also some of his insights. So Rob is one of the few scholars that actually works at the um, nexus of justice and um, you know miscarriage of justice, I would say. Um, and so uh, Lindsay Smith, who is uh, works for the Center for Advancing Correctional Excellence and is a doctoral student um, and who's also just made great strides this semester by passing her map, which is a major comprehensive approach um, this semester. So Lindsay uh, will be leading a discussion with Rob about some of his work. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay and Rob uh, for discussion. And then for those of you in the um, audience, you are more than welcome to use the Q&A um, to raise questions and either Lindsay or myself will bring them um, to Rob or Lindsay or anyone else uh, on the team. All right, I'll turn it over to you all. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, so welcome to our first spotlight session, Miscarriages of Justice and Exonerations. Um, thank you for that um, warm welcome. Uh, my name is Lindsay. Like Faye said, I am a doctoral student at ACE. Our first speaker is Dr. Norris, new associate professor. Um, and so I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself and a little bit about what you're working on right now. Sure, thank you. Uh, I haven't signed the contract yet, so I don't know that I, <laughs> I'm deserving of the label uh, just yet. Thank you for that, and thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Rob Norris. I've been here for four years um, at George Mason, um, but I've been doing work in the wrongful conviction space since essentially I started graduate school, which was way back in 2009. Um, and it's been really cool to see because when I started at, you know, I'd go to ASC and there would be about uh, 12 of us doing this. And now we, I think this year we organized seven or eight panels uh, touching on wrongful conviction work. And it's been really exciting to see it grow. And I'm happy to talk about it with you all. Great. So I'm wondering then um, if you can give us kind of a brief overview of like the innocence movement, just to kind of like lay the foundation of like where um, that literature sits. Yeah, so um, the innocence movement, right? Um, I would argue it's a social movement, but some would disagree. Um, uh, to me, it's this sort of amorphous collection of everything happening in uh, the space dealing with wrongful conviction, right? The conviction of people who are innocent of the crimes for which they were convicted. Um, I think most prominently people probably have heard of or think about the Innocence Project. Um, I know that's sort of a, a very popular organization. They are one of, um, I think there's a group called the Innocence Network now that has, last I checked, 69 organizations, 50 some of them are in the US, the rest are international, um, that are all working in this space to either um, do casework to free innocent people, to um, advocate for policy reform, uh, to educate the public, that kind of thing. Um, in the research world, you know, it's been interesting to watch the shift. We largely started in law. Um, almost all of the early writing on this topic was legal scholarship, and it was very, um, very case focused, very descriptive. A lot of um, case narratives, a lot of just counting of factors in cases and things like that. And I'd say over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years since kind of I've been doing this, um, I've really seen it shift in a lot of ways toward um, experimental work, particularly in psychology and psychology and law. Um, we have people in our department doing work on false guilty pleas and false confessions and eyewitness misidentifications and things like that. Um, my work has been more in the public opinion sphere. So seeing how people respond to this information and how it changes their, their policy preferences and their views of, uh, of police or toward the criminal justice system. Uh, there's been this really interesting growing literature on kind of the aftermath of wrongful conviction. Um, so what are the consequences for exonerees, for their families, for their networks? Um, more recently for others, so people like the original crime victim in a case of a wrongful conviction, what do they go through? Uh, often believing that justice has been served and then learning 5, 10, 20 years later that uh, the person that was convicted all along was actually innocent. Um, so it's really starting to branch out, I think, in a lot of really cool and interesting ways and is finally sort of gaining, uh, I would argue, kind of a theoretical grounding in the social sciences um, that was missing for most of, of its history. Yeah. 
So what do you feel like are some factors that lead to the wrongful conviction of people? So whether that's plea bargains or various things, um, what do you think are some of those factors? So we have what we call the canonical list. Um, eyewitness misidentification is everywhere. Uh, false confessions and false guilty pleas. Um, I think false pleas are probably a much bigger problem than we tend to realize. That's kind of a new area of, of kind of research and scholarship. Um, Perjury, false accusation is another one that the, the, the National Registry of Exonerations, which is our largest kind of data set of cases, um, that's what they include and they actually have as their sort of leading factor. Um, it's a very broad kind of ambiguous category that includes things like the use of criminal informants. It could just be a false accusation. It could be any number of things. Um, and then a lot of issues with forensics and other types of scientific evidence. Um, in the most extreme cases, kind of blatant and intentional uh, sort of misconduct, right? It's called dry labbing if you fake results. But more often than that, I think it's more, um, you know, somebody misinterpreting the results of a scientific test or when tra trying to translate that test to jurors, um, sort of misspeaking or misleading them in some way. Um, and then official misconduct is kind of one of the other big ones right now, um, typically relating to prosecutors, but also police and others. Those are kind of the main ones that we, we know something about. Um, of course, uh, like everything in the criminal legal system, right? Um, race underlies everything we do in the space. Um, class underlies everything we do in the space. In the wrongful conviction world, those things are really hard to measure because we don't have data, right? Um, but we know that they influence us in, in, in kind of important ways. Yeah, definitely. So then what role do you think, um, you touched on a little bit like technology, I know like, throughout the innocence movement, like DNA analysis and things, um, what role do you think that um, has played and will probably continue to play in the future? DNA is, um, <laughs> it's interesting. DNA is uh, in many ways, the reason people care, <laughs> right? Um, you know, wrongful convictions go back uh, quite literally centuries. The, the, what's considered the first one in the US was in 1819. Um, you can find any number of prominent examples throughout our history, um, from Sacco and Banzetti to the Scottsboro Boys, all these kinds of historical cases. The first DNA-based exoneration was in 1989. So if you look at kind of collections of exoneration cases, they almost always start then. Um, and the Innocence Project was founded to only work on DNA cases, and they've been kind of the advocacy leaders in this space. Uh, and I think in a lot of ways, DNA... Um, I've argued it was sort of the political opportunity for people, right? Um, it was discovered in, uh, the DNA fingerprint was discovered in the 80s, was used in the legal system starting in the, the sort of mid to late 80s. Um, and once it was used in this particular way, it made it really hard to suggest that somebody was actually guilty, right? That was always the pushback was, well, sure they were exonerated, but how do you really know they didn't do it? Right. Um, when there was a case where all the indication points to one person or, um, you know, if there was a child victim or something like that, and all of a sudden you have DNA proving that the person in prison was not the offender, it's, it's kind of hard to push back against that. Um, and it was after that that I think we really started to see um, kind of public attention and policy attention on it. Right. The 90s were huge for this. Um, the National Institute of Justice produced a report on this in 96. Um, the first death penalty DNA exoneration was a little bit before that. Um, so in a lot of ways, that was sort of the, the kind of tipping point for people to start caring. Um, what's been interesting to see, though, recently is, is DNA technology has changed so much in the last kind of 20 years. And the legal system and science don't always move at the same speed, right? So for years, um, people were being convicted based on touch DNA, right? So just what we leave behind when we touch anything before that science was well developed, right? So one of the things the Innocence Project has really been, um, I think, trying to push for is uh, sort of more rigorous review of that work, right? That was the basis of so many convictions. Um, just the, the way that they can even test bodily fluids. It used to require a pretty big, pretty clear sample. Now they can test it from all sorts of things, from hair follicles. Um, so it's this sort of push and pull, right? It can contribute to errors in ways because science moves so much quicker than, than law does. Um, but it's also largely the reason we were able to sort of get attention on the back end of it. So it's been kind of a fascinating thing to, to see. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in thinking about um, individuals who are attempting to maybe appeal um, a wrongful conviction, what barriers do you think they face um, throughout that process? 
uh, I can sort of flippantly say the Constitution. Um, you know, the uh, there's a great quote uh, in an article by this guy named Justin Brooks, who's the he's a law professor uh, and the head of the California Innocence Project, and he he says something to the effect of, "Our Constitution is only designed to guarantee fair trials, not ones that produce the right results." Right. Um, our entire sort of appellate system with a few relatively few exceptions is built upon the idea of procedural error, right? You don't appeal based on innocence. You can't say, well, I was convicted, but I'm innocent and therefore appeal. You have to demonstrate some type of procedural error. My rights were violated. The prosecutor withheld evidence. My lawyer was ineffective, whatever it was. Um, our system is simply not designed to reinvestigate factual error after the fact, um, for the most part. Um, so that in and of itself is kind of a huge barrier, right? Like innocence, um, it's always weird to say, but innocence is not really a concept in our system, right? You're, we talk about innocence until proven guilty, but really when you're adjudicated, you're not found guilty or innocent, you're found guilty or not guilty, right? Um, innocence is not a thing that we kind of actually mean something in law. That's starting to shift a little bit. States are toying with kind of new evidence statutes and uh, whether or not we should allow appeals based on innocence as its own sort of freestanding claim um, so we'll see what happens in the next kind of couple decades, but that's a big one. The other one, honestly, is like resources, right? Um, it takes a lot to reinvestigate a case. Uh, it takes a whole lot, and a lot of times you're 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 looking for old evidence. Even if that evidence is there, it could be degraded. It could not have been stored properly. You're trying to track down witnesses who may have moved or died or uh, forgotten whatever they're gonna they they were, would be able to contribute. Um, and it's one of the reasons, you know, if you look at the National Registry, there's something like 3,000 exonerations now. Um, those are the few, as weird as it says to say, who are quite fortunate, right? That they were able to have their cases reinvestigated, the evidence was, be able, was, was found, tested, witnesses, whatever. Um, and then they also were able to win the legal battle or the political battle to actually get out. Um, we, we love to use the phrase, the tip of the iceberg. Odds are the ones we know about are a really small fraction um, of those who are who are actually innocent and, and convicted for crimes they didn't commit. Yeah. So then, how do you think um, those folks who take a plea deal? How is that process then impacted if that was sort of the the route of the um, conviction? So for a lot of not all, but a lot of plea deals, you actually waive your right to appeal um, as part of the plea agreement, uh, and so it really requires something pretty extreme. Um, you know, if you look at known exonerations, around 20% of them were people who pled guilty. As we know, 90 some odd percent of convictions are through pleas. Um, so I suppose there's different interpretations of this. One uh, that I hear often is, well, innocent people just don't plead guilty that often. Um, I would actually argue that the rate of false pleas is probably higher than the rate of wrongful conviction at trial, um, particularly for like low level crimes. Um, I can imagine somebody sitting in jail and they're like, look, you can go home if you plead guilty to this. Like I probably would, right? Like I have a family at home, I have a job, right? Um, so I suspect the rate is much, much higher, but there are additional procedural battles. Um, the other part is there just isn't evidence in plea cases a lot of times, you know? Um, if you look through case files for pleas, it's not that uncommon to literally have it be one sheet of paper that is the plea agreement. And so there's nothing to reinvestigate, right? There's not really a paper trail. There's not physical evidence. Um, or if there was any of that, it gets destroyed once the plea is um, sort of entered. Um, so I, I suspect uh, there are far, far more wrongful convictions through plea than we will ever know about um, mm -hmm. just because of all of these kind of procedural and, and very practical hurdles. Yeah, so then in those cases, um, do you think it, the typical route then to try to appeal if that is an option would be through um, potentially not being notified of their rights by a defense attorney or something like that, or what typically um, would be someone's options? So it could be that um, the Supreme Court has, uh, not the current Supreme Court, the, a previous Supreme Court, um, was uh, receptive to the idea that ineffective counsel claims also apply to pleas, because for a long time that wasn't the case. Uh, and there's a great quote um, from the decision that says we have to, something to the effect of, we have to recognize our system today is a system of pleas, not a system of trials. Right. And so there is there are ineffective claim ineffective counsel claims. There are still potentially Brady violations. Right. If the prosecutor doesn't turn over um, exculpatory evidence uh, and there are still some opportunities for new evidence. If, if 
a new witness comes forward, or again, you discover that the, the police didn't bring something forth um, that will allow you to sort of open up the appellate kind of process. Um, it's just more difficult, but it typically does happen through a similar kind of legal process. Mm -hmm. So then um, what reforms do you think are necessary to maybe try to um, mitigate the impacts of being wrongfully convicted um, or even maybe to um, reduce the number of individuals that take a plea deal when they're innocent? Yeah, so I kind of think about these in like categories, right? There's um, There are some relatively small scale investigatory reforms that would help to some degree, right? Things like, uh, you know, psychologists have been studying eyewitness procedures for literally decades and decades. Um, and we have a pretty good set of established practices that reduce misidentifications. Now, they also might reduce some accurate identifications. That's sort of part of the policy debate, right? But um, things like having blind administration, so the, per the officer administering the lineup doesn't know who the suspect is, so they can't get feedback, um, recording confidence statements, recording the procedure, these kinds of things. Um, Things like recording interrogations, right? Um, providing a record of uh, kind of what happens so that jurors and judges can better evaluate whether a confession seems valid or not um, and the extent to which somebody was coerced into it. Um, so there's all sorts of small-ish things like that that we can do. Um, on the plea front, it's tough, right? Um, our system is so reliant on it that, um, I mean, at the extreme end, you could say, well, just get rid of plea bargaining. Uh, that's probably not gonna happen realistically. Um, we do have Alfred pleas, which allows somebody to sort of accept the conviction, but maintain innocence. Um, in, in practice, they don't do much in terms of protecting the innocent. There's no way of knowing um, of those who take Alfred pleas who's actually innocent and so forth. Um, and then there's all sorts of sort of, you know, forensic, one of the arguments has been to sort of decouple forensic labs from state police, right? Most state labs are state police labs. So there's sort of, some would argue inherent kind of bias in, in baked into those. Um, I tend to sort of agree with that perspective. Um, and so there's a lot of sort of, again, relatively small-ish things we could do. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I think on the back end, you know, one of the things that I've done work on and um, sort of become passionate about is kind of compensation and reentry services for exonerees. Um, typically exonerees are actually entitled to less than those who are released on parole, probation or supervised release. Um, they're quite literally cut loose. There's no gate money. There's no um, planning. If you talk to a lot of exonerees, they didn't find out they were going home until the day of or the day before. Um, and they literally walk out and go, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been a, a sort of a big advocate for um, increased reentry services for exonerees. Yeah, um, definitely. So then what, based on um, sort of that what other barriers do you think individuals face um, after being exonerated? Not just in like initially, um, but maybe throughout the reintegration process. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's similar in a lot of ways to anybody who's returning from incarceration, right? There's um, in, in part given like who's targeted initially, right? So it's a lot of people who um, are, are poor, they don't have great sort of Sort of social situations to return to, they're kind of just thrown back into it. Um, and so you see a lot of kind of economic hardship um, that again, I think you, you see with anybody who's returning from incarceration. Um, records are typically not expunged automatically either. Even if somebody's exonerated, only a handful of states, as far as I know, automatically expunge records at exoneration. You typically have to go back to court to fight for that. And so a lot of exonerees report this sort of catch-22 they're in when they fill out job applications. Like they have that little box they have to check, right? And if they check, if they don't check it um, and the person runs a background check and sees a murder conviction, they're not gonna get the job. If nothing else, because they lied on a job application. Uh, and if they check yes, they're probably not gonna get the job because they have a murder conviction on their record, right? Um, so that's, record expungement is a huge barrier for a lot of people. Um, and then there's a lot of like, just the psychological trauma of sort of dealing with not only the incarceration, which in itself can produce sort of PTSD and all these other sorts of, um, kind of psychological and emotional challenges. But uh, some have argued that the fact that people are innocent while incarcerated creates an additional layer of sort of psychological trauma. Um, it's kind of hard to unpack exactly what that looks like, right? But um, yeah, and then all the practical stuff that comes with being incarcerated for a long time. Um, you know, the average length of incarceration for an exoneree is around nine years. Um, 
I was just looking today, there are 206 different exonerees who were uh, incarcerated for 25 years or more before they were exonerated. Um, and there are, I actually wrote this down, 39 exonerees who were incarcerated longer than I've been alive um, before they were exonerated. I just turned 35. So um, just for context of, of um, what people are going through, right? And so there's all sorts of practical stuff you see coming out of the institution, right? Not knowing how to navigate the modern world, technology, right. um, all of these things that, that you're sort of just deprived of um, while you're in. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is sort of, right, families and networks, Pe you lose people, um, whether it's losing a parent, um, the number of exonerees I know who had kids while they, whose kids were born while they were incarcerated is pretty astounding, um, or just losing touch with their family. Um, I just, I was at the Innocence Network conference a few weeks ago and um, met an exoneree who's, uh, he was preparing for his family to visit for Father's Day weekend. And two nights before they were supposed to come, his 21 year old son, his 21 year old son was murdered, right? And he was incarcerated awaiting sort of a visit from them. Um, again, that's not unique to exonerees necessarily, but um, it's all of that on top of the fact that you're fighting the legal battle to navigate your case. Right. Wow, yeah. Um, so then what resources do you think um, on top of just reentry services that might be unique or specific to exonerees might be helpful? Or do you even know of like any current reentry programs that are specific um, to exonerees? So the, the first thing I'll say, and, and people sometimes think I'm being dismissive when I say that, if you actually ask exonerees more than anything, what they want is an apology, right? They want somebody to acknowledge that the state got it wrong uh, and did this to them, um, which I actually think is quite important, right? It's kind of a step toward the healing process, um, mm -hmm. I think. And that's typically not in, not in place, although you hear kind of isolated incidents. Um, I mean, money is the obvious thing, right? Um, give people money for what they went through. Um, of course, you can't, that doesn't bring back all of these other things, but it at least sort of gives you something to work with to try to sort of rebuild. Um, yeah, the I, I think a lot of it's the typical reentry services, right, that you hear about things like um, healthcare, counseling, um, help with the job, help going back to school, if, depending on the age of the person and what they want to do. Um, there's any number of things we can do. Um, you know, states are hit or miss in terms of what they provide. Um, oddly enough, we tend to hold up Texas as like the best compensation statute. Um, I don't know if that's because they get it wrong so much that they felt they had to or because they're a, a caring place, I don't know. Uh, I have a suspicion. Um, no offense to any Texans in the, the audience. Um, but they actually have a, a pretty comprehensive compensation statute in terms of money, services, educational assistance. Um, they and a few other states that even provide things like if you miss child support payments while you were incarcerated, you get extra compensation to provide that those. Um, so things like that certainly help. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's been really cool to see is a lot of exonerees are starting to sort of start their own organizations to help with this. So there's a group called Witness to Innocence that's based in Pennsylvania that um, they specifically work with uh, death row exonerees, but their sort of twofold goal is one to help people when they're getting off of death row or exonerated from death row. The other is, is sort of to abolish the death penalty. So they have kind of a policy goal as well, um, but they do a ton of work with exonerees, even in terms of organizing sort of speaking opportunities for them so they can make some extra money, um, promoting their case, that kind of thing. And more and more exonerees are starting uh, to do that kind of thing to realize that ultimately they can help each other in ways that a lot of other people can't. Um, so I think that's been one of the coolest developments to see in terms of the, the, the movement broadly. Yeah, that's really interesting. So do you know of any, I know you said you do some stuff on public opinion, um, but I'm really interested in the, the family connection aspect and maybe how their opinions shift or change throughout that entire process um, and, and what those connections might look like after the fact. That's really interesting. I, I will admit there, there are uh, people who certainly know more about this than me. Um, what, what I can tell you that's I found really fascinating is um, it's kind of all over the place. Um, you know, I've, I've met exonerees who, when they got out, their, their children didn't want anything to do with them because they felt like they had sort of been out of their life for a long time. There are others who reconnected almost immediately and kind of everything in between. Um, and I think that's pretty typical for um, children who experience parental incarceration anyway. 
Um, you know, significant others are another kind of interesting thing. I, I um, when I was deciding whether to do a PowerPoint, I was going to talk about this guy named Mark Shand, who's he was incarcerated for almost 27 years. Um, his when he went in, his girlfriend Maya, she visited him every single week except two for 27 years. They got married in prison. Um, and it's like just the most amazing sort of powerful people staying together story, but that's not right. Always the case. Um, you know, there was uh, another exoneree named Gary Gogger who was convicted of killing his parents. Um, his sister and brother-in-law sort of, he became estranged from them because she thought he had killed their parents. Right. And, and rebuilding that connection doesn't just happen because a lawyer said, or, or a court says that you weren't, you didn't do it after, you know, 15 years or something. Um, so it's really kind of all over the place. And it's one of those, um, uh, I don't know if he's on here, but uh, Andrew Madrigal in our department um, is, is sort of planning a dissertation to look at, to uh, talk to children of exonerees. Um, it's one of those areas we really don't know a great deal about beyond just kind of these anecdotal uh, examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, kind of going in a different direction now, um, in what ways do you think capital punishment is sort of intertwined with um, discussions of wrongful convictions and like sort of the degree to which um, it becomes a much more serious conversation. So the, it's, it's really interesting, right? The innocence movement as sort of an advocacy group and the anti-death penalty movement are these really <laughs> both sort of friendly but conflicting groups, right? Um, I think a lot of people sort of assume they're in lockstep and they're, they're are in some cases, but often not. Um, the, the death penalty, of course, sort of ramps up the consequence, right? And so it's, in some ways, it, it, it makes it sort of more of an easy sell, right? Those cases tend to get more attention. Um, I think a lot of people that have only heard one or two stories, there's a good chance they've heard death penalty exonerations because they mm -hmm. just tend to get a lot of media coverage. They tend to be the subject of documentaries and things like that. And in a lot of ways that that has sort of, that propelled the innocence movement, right? It got them more attention. And it's true in reverse too, the death penalty, you know, if you look back to the nineties, like the death penalty was sort of roaring back. Um, executions were going up, death sentences were going up, more states were sort of re-implementing the death penalty. Um, and if you look around the turn of the century, uh, innocence has become kind of the leading theme or frame in the death penalty debate, um, which has been documented sort of empirically. And I, I also think just, um, if you were to look yourself at capital punishment coverage, you'd see that. So they've really helped each other in some ways. What's interesting or been interesting to me and something that I keep wanting to revisit and write about is that a lot of death penalty folks are also kind of frustrated by the wrongful conviction focus, right? Because their argument is that shouldn't be the reason we don't have a death penalty, right? The death penalty has all of these other problems that have nothing to do with innocence. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're, their concern, and this isn't true of just the death penalty, this is true of, I've, I've heard this from prison reformers, I've heard this from defense attorneys, they're worried that innocence sort of sucks the air out of the room, that you get people thinking that the only time to care is when the person's innocent, right? And it's been I, I'm just personally like a struggle of mine in doing this work is I always try to be like, well, it's not, this isn't the only problem, right? This is a, a problem among many. Um, so there is a little bit of conflict. The other, the other source of conflict is, um, in some states, innocence reformers won't touch the death penalty for very political reasons, right? They know that, um, you know, if you're in Texas and you're doing innocence work, as soon as you start talking about the death penalty, you're going to lose people, right? If part of your advocacy group is, well, let's also abolish the death penalty. And so there's this weird kind of push and pull between the two of them that I've found really interesting. Um, I don't know that anybody's sort of written about it that way. Um, but it's something I see every time I talk to innocence advocates, right? I talk to those in the South and in the North and they have very different perspectives on sort of how to use the death penalty strategically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then going off of that um, sort of big picture question, um, why do you think studying miscarriages of justice, not necessarily um, just exonerations, um, but miscarriages of justice in general is so important? Well, I, so it, <laughs> You know, it's it's funny that this pa this panel was, or session was called miscarriage of justice because actually I've kind of stopped using that phrase um, in part because of sort of what I was just trying to to say. Like, mm -hmm. if you go back to old writing, people used to use miscarriage of justice, wrongful convictions, and actual innocence kind of interchangeably, and I've really had to sort of force myself to stop doing that because, in my view, um, 
you know, when police shoot an, an unarmed citizen, that's a miscarriage of justice, right? Um, when somebody's mistreated while they're in prison or jail or any form of custody, guilty, innocent doesn't matter. That's a miscarriage of justice, right? Um, I, I always try to, like, we are one subset of miscarriages of justice. Um, I think generally, you know, look, it's, if nothing else, um, most wrongful convictions involve a crime that occurred. And by definition, if you get the wrong person, you're probably not getting the right person. So even if you're the most law and order focused person, if nothing else, it's about accuracy, right? Um, to me, it's more about understanding flaws so that we can get better, right? Um, if, if you're not honest about the mistakes you make, there's, it's really hard to improve upon things. Um, and so to me, it's just sort of a window uh, into our system, which I think in turn is this fascinating window into all sorts of social problems, right? Criminal justice is this really interesting lens to see race and gender and class and all of these other kinds of social ills. And I think wrongful convictions give us sort of a sub window into that, right? And I think, um, and, and honestly, the other part is just frankly, like the stories are really captivating for people. It's sort of easy to talk to people about it. Even if they're not inclined to care about the criminal legal system in any way, right? Um, the stories themselves are captivating and it's easy to capture people's attention. Um, and I actually think that's a really valuable thing as scholars and researchers, right? Um, doing things in ways that can actually get people outside of the academy to care, I think is really important. And I think this is a, a space we can do that. Mm -hmm. Great, so we have a couple of Q and A questions. So we'll sort of move in that direction now. Um, and I think this, um, there's a great segue question um, from Johnny. So the question is, are there areas in wrongful convictions research where you'd like to see more work done specifically to advance the social justice agenda? Yeah, yeah. Um, a number of them. One of them, uh, and this will feel like a very appropriate response, is the sort of experiences of exonerees pre-exoneration, um, which I think Johnny knows something about. Um, Beyond that, I, I mentioned this earlier, but things like uh, race, I think we need a better understanding of, we know race plays a role in virtually every part of the process, right? We don't really have a great, at least empirical understanding of how it specifically influences factual errors. Um, we see some really interesting historical patterns, but I think we need more work in that space. Um, same with wrongful convictions of women. Um, so, so far of, of the exonerees we know about, 91% um, of them are men. Um, but I, it, I find it hard to believe that 91% of people wrongly convicted are men. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with the types of cases and the types of convictions and the difficulty of overturning them. For example, like there've been a bunch of exonerations and shaken baby cases in the last few years. Those are really hard to reinvestigate and uh, overturn, right? Um, so there is some growing work in that. I think that that's really important. Um, I also think juvenile wrongful convictions is another one we don't know much about. Um, in part because frankly, like th there's all sorts of reasons studying, as I'm sure everybody knows, like studying juveniles is difficult. There's all sorts of, in terms of just confidentiality and everything like that. Um, but some have argued that the juvenile system is sort of a breeding ground for wrongful convictions because it's this weird mix of like adult-like procedures, but also this sort of loosey-goosey kind of discussion of kids, right? Um, so I think that's another, um, another big one to me. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is with mental health and exonerations, we know um, a disproportionate number of exonerees suffer from some type of mental illness or developmental disability. We know a bit about it in very specific contexts, right? So like psychologists have done a great job of sort of studying and thinking about mental health in the context of say police interrogations. But I think we can do a sort of a better job broadly of thinking about wrongful convictions um, and the role that mental health plays in, in kind of producing them. Yeah, so it sounds like there's a lot of areas uh, we can definitely go in, so that's yeah. great. Um, join us, join us. <laughs> I'm already interested because you said gender and race and I'm automatically excited about that. There's a lot um, of room for it. <laughs> so um, another question we have um, is, so in your opinion, to what extent will, and I think this is an acronym, CRUs, be able to develop effective means of preventing wrongful convictions? Is it, are they going for CIUs? 
that it? C R E U. I'm not familiar. C R U. I'm not sure. Um, Unless they mean conviction review unit, is there a way to confirm? Possibly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, so typically. Um, I usually hear them called CIUs, which is conviction integrity unit. That's like the, the, but I, the same idea. So the idea with those typically is they're within prosecutor's offices. Um, and uh, it's basically a way for prosecutorial offices to have a segment of their, their people kind of review questionable convictions. It's really amazing in theory. Um, honestly, even the fact that prosecutors are willing to acknowledge that this happens is actually like a massive step in the right direction because 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. Um, if anybody doesn't believe me, Edwin Meese, whose name is around our campus, uh, famously said that an innocent person is not a suspect, right? Um, so uh, prosecutors simply denied it for a long time. Um, so in theory, it's great. Uh, what we don't know yet, because they haven't been around long enough, is sort of whether or not they're effective in, in any real way, right? So some of them seem to be. There have actually been a bunch of exonerations from these, these groups. They tend to be concentrated in a few DA's offices. A lot of them um, seem to be more political than anything else, right? It's a way for a district attorney to sort of sell themselves politically as like, look, I'm forward thinking and progressive and I'm open to this. We'll see in the next kind of 10 years as more pop up if they're actually effective. Um, but in theory, they're wonderful, right? Um, we just don't, we don't have enough. This is one of those where we don't have enough kind of data over time to actually know what their effect is. But it's, uh, I suppose they're better than not having one, I would say. Great. So um, those are all the questions I have. Dr. Taxman or Dr. Roots, do you have any questions for Dr. Norris? Um, yes. Well, Rob, thank you very much. Uh, so my question has to do with the American public. How much does the American public care about this problem within the criminal legal system um, having to do with, you know, people pleading to a crime that they didn't commit um, or, you know, this notion that people can be incarcerated for many years only to find out that they really did not commit that crime. Um, does the public care in some ways? Um, care might be a strong word. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I would, uh, and in some ways I'm going to sort of pull on some of my own research, um, not because it's anything particularly special, but because I'm just familiar with it. Um, what we consistently find is that people are at least aware of it, right? Which is a step at least. Uh -huh. Whether or not awareness translates to caring in kind of a real, I would say political sense, right? Is it gonna affect their policy preferences? Is it, gonna, is it gonna affect their kind of voting decisions? I'm still pretty skeptical of that. Um, what I can say is people are at least interested, right? I think, um, you know, Netflix is a sign of that. There's like a new documentary every two weeks. So clearly this stuff sells um, and awareness is a good thing. Um, I don't know that we've reached the point that people have this anywhere near the top of their priority list though, right? And I think that's true of criminal justice kind of broadly in some ways, it's kind of, it ebbs and flows, right? In the eighties and nineties, criminal justice was everywhere in sort of political thought and political debate. And then it kind of died down as we talked about foreign affairs and the economy and now COVID and all of that sort of thing. Um, I, I do think people care at least on sort of a, a moment to moment level, right? You tell somebody a story of somebody who went through this and it's kind of hard not to react. Um, I think, you know, we prompt, we can prompt emotional reactions. We can trigger at least short-term changes in policy preferences. Um, and we found that pretty consistently. I, I, I really do hesitate to say that people care enough for it to affect their actual kind of political behavior in meaningful ways, which to me, that's like the ultimate sign of caring, right? This is going to change how I vote. Um, but I do think people care to a degree, I would say. I guess, you know, I use that term because the question that I have is, can this be the impetus for trying to reform those things in our system? So for example, we know from you know, studies that providing an attorney at arraignment can have a pretty dramatic impact on a person's trajectory in the criminal legal system. 
um, including prosecutors having to uh, assess whether or not they have sufficient evidence to merit prosecution just at that early stage, but we don't invest in attorneys. You know, so to me, the question is, is can we use this, you know, if you don't want to use the term miscarriage of justice, can we use um, this information about how often people are convicted of crimes that they didn't commit to be an incentive for us to really focus our attentions on those weak points in the, you know, criminal legal process? In, in that in that sense, I would say absolutely, right? Um, and just to, to oh, sort of a big examples and then can kind of work backwards from there. Um, you know, innocence has been hugely influential in the decline of the death penalty, right? Um, both in terms of states abolishing it, if you believe Frank Baumgartner's work, which I, I'm inclined to, um, it has quite literally changed how uh, capital juries vote on sentencing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Kirk, Bloodsworth, who I, I was the first death row DNA exoneree, um, he became not only an anti-death penalty advocate, but also a big prison reform advocate. He had a, a pretty rough time in prison. Um, and he, he said pretty openly, like, when I go talk to lawmakers, the fact that I was innocent makes them listen, right? It's a lot easier, I think, for a lot of people to um, be receptive to the idea that prison conditions can change when it's coming from somebody who shouldn't have been there factually in the first place. And it shouldn't, I wouldn't, I would argue it shouldn't be that way, but it sort of pragmatically kind of is, right? Um, I think that's true to your reentry services. Uh, I actually just, one of my honor students this semester um, just did this cool little survey experiment asking about reentry policies. And all she changed was saying a person returning from incarceration and an innocent person. And it completely changes how people <laughs> respond to that question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that can be true throughout the system um, if used strategically. Um, if people are okay with the idea that it might make people sort of over-focus on innocence. Um, but from a purely pragmatic perspective, I'd be like, sure, why not, right? If it gets the policy changed, mm -hmm. a part of me is like, well, who cares why, <laughs> you know? Um, if you abolish the death penalty, I don't care if you do it to save money or because you're worried about the innocent, you abolished it, right? That's more important to me. Um, so I absolutely think it could... Um, be used strategically to advocate for other types of policy reforms that aren't specific to wrongful convictions. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Danielle, do you have any questions or comments? I was gonna ask Rob to tell us his lead-in story. I know that he didn't just wake up one day and go, hey, I'm gonna study exonerees or exonerations, where does it come from? What's, sure. what's part of your, what's part um, of your paper? Can I share my, I actually have a, uh, a PowerPoint pulled up that has the, has pictures on it. Am I able to share my screen? I think so. Uh, let me see if, can you click on it and see if it'll share for you. Cameron can fix it. I think you can. Yep. Yeah. yeah, there you go. There we go. Um, <laughs> I told you I had put a, I, I had put a PowerPoint together because I didn't know. Um, so yeah, this is sort of the, the, I'll make this bigger so you can, Kind of see, I was going to start on language. See, um, so yeah, this well, the, the backstory to this quickly is um, the, that pictures of a girl named Dawn Hamilton, who um, was a nine year old girl who in 1984 disappeared in Maryland. Um, she was found in the woods, it was like a, a horrendously brutal crime. She had been raped and murdered, her head had been smashed with a rock, it was just really terrible. The last people to see her alive had been um, two little boys who had seen her in a pond or near a pond in the woods with a, a stranger. And they worked with police to put together that sketch that's probably a little bit hard to see. Um, and after some investigation, police settled on a guy named Kirk Bloodsworth, who um, was, a, had, was an honorably discharged Marine who lived nearby. Um, the kids had not mentioned that he had bright red hair or that he had big sideburns, but he was arrested anyway, convicted, um, sentenced to death. He, his sentence was commuted to life in prison, but in 1993, um, he was cleared using DNA evidence. And that's a picture of him when he was getting out. Um, as just sort of an aside to this, which actually, Danielle, I don't know if I've ever even told you this. Uh, one of, when he got out, he was, it was still the early days of DNA and innocence. And so he was still stigmatized pretty severely in his community. So one of his goals was to try to help find whoever actually committed the crime. And years later, they ran after the CODIS database was, um, developed, they ran the DNA through it and it came back for a hit um, for a guy named Kimberly Ruffner, 
who oddly enough had um, been in the cell right below Kirk's. They used to lift weights together in prison um, afterwards. But uh, Kirk became a big advocate for abolishing the death penalty for prison reform. Um, that picture of him is a, a much more recent one, obviously, but I met him when I was in college. Um, one of my professors brought him to campus and, and was nice enough to introduce me to him. And it was through reading a book about his case that led me to another book about another case and quite literally sort of made me go to grad school and um, become a researcher uh, at all. And uh, I did have had the opportunity to tell him that in person and I dedicated a book to him um, because he's just a really kind of special person. Uh, he also um, started making jewelry and, and made uh, what looked like sports championship rings for every exoneree that he was able to afford to make one for. And I thought that was just a really cool kind of end of his story, but that's, that's him. Um, down there in the bottom right, Kirk Bloodsworth. All right, so we have oh, just one more minute left of your session and thank you so much, uh, very interesting. Um, but we do have a Q and A. Um, one of our attendees wants to know um, whether or not there should be re repercussions or accountability for officials in the criminal legal system when um, it is uncovered that a person was innocent or um, not guilty of the crime that they were convicted of, and you know whether or not we need to have consequences. Um, I mean, I would say yes, uh, as anybody who knows me is probably not surprised to hear me say, but, you know, truthfully, like prosecutors right now have absolute immunity, police have qualified immunity, and there are some semi-reasonable arguments for why those things are in place. Um, but in some of these cases, and, and there are some cases, right, where you could have somebody who's legitimately trying to do the right thing, and for whatever reason, um, you know, ended up contributing to somebody being wrongly convicted. There are some really extreme examples where prosecutors knowingly withheld evidence for years and years and years. Um, and I guess I, I suppose my just sort of political orientation is to think that those in positions of such authority, when they abuse it to that degree, have to be held accountable in some way. I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's criminally liable. I don't know if that's just losing their job, if it's contributing to sort of the, the reentry package in some way. Um, but it's extremely frustrating that a prosecutor can engage in that kind of behavior, literally destroy the lives of not only the exoneree, but their family, the crime victim, their entire networks, and not face any consequence for it. It's just sort of a hard thing as a citizen for me to swallow. All right, well, thank you um, for um, a very fascinating um, spotlight session. Um, anyone who's interested in following up can reach Rob Norris at George Mason University and the Department of Criminology Law and Society. Um, and um, we wanna also thank Lindsay Smith for her excellent facilitation of this discussion. So we will take actually only a three minute break before we begin our next panel on practitioners um, who are leading in the era of social progress. Um, so take a few minutes break and I look forward to seeing everyone back here at two o'clock. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Okay.